Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very first Nittany AI Connect virtual event, the future of healthcare using big data, advanced analytics, and AI to transform health, powered by IBM Watson Health. My name is Patty Doroshenko, and I'm the Nittany AI Connect program manager. Before we proceed with today's speakers, I have a few meeting logistics and announcements. First, I'd like to make everyone aware that we are recording this event. Because we are recording, we'd like to ask that everyone keep our two speakers keep your speakers off and your because we're since we're recording and just also keep your video off um, except for the two speakers until the q a portion of jane's talk after the event we'll spend some time editing and as soon as the final version is ready we'll be in touch via email with the link to the recording which will also be available through our youtube channel our last housekeeping item is regarding questions. If you do have any questions during the event, please put them in the chat and we will get them to Jane as soon as we can. But we also have a designated time at the end of the event for the Q&A. The event this afternoon will begin with Maggie O'Shea, who leads IBM's early professional recruiting efforts with Penn State. Then we will turn things over to Jane Snowdon, who is the Associate Chief Health Officer with IBM Watson Health. Our audience today is made up of many AI Alliance alumni, both current and past students, faculty, staff, and many individuals with the Center for Medical Innovation. We are excited that for what we believe will be a great discussion about some of the ways AI is impacting the healthcare space. I'd like to start by thanking our partner, IBM Watson, for volunteering their time and expertise this afternoon. I'd also like to thank the team at the Center for Medical Innovation, who has been an incredible partner to the Nittany AI Alliance in a number of ways and helped us to share the information about this event with many of you. As I stated earlier, to kick off the event, joining us from IBM is Maggie O'Shea, who leads IBM's early professional recruiting efforts at Penn State. Maggie will be joining us again in the fall to share opportunities for students interested in pursuing internship and early professional opportunities, but is here to give us a sneak peek of what we can look forward to. If anyone is interested in learning more about opportunities with IBM, feel free to drop a quick note in the chat and Maggie will contact you. Maggie, I'll turn the meeting over to you. Thank you, Patty, and hello, everyone. Very nice to virtually meet you here. As Patty had mentioned, my name is Maggie O'Shea. I am a campus recruiter with IBM and I support our intern, early professional and co-op hiring across all of our various disciplines. So the hope here today is that you are a student or you know of students um, that are potentially considering IBM for future opportunities and that you know what, what you're hearing today is encouraging and inspiring you um, so I am happy to be a contact for, for folks that are on the line here today. So while we are wrapping up recruiting for 2021 roles currently, I am more than happy again to be a resource for students for when we kick off recruiting again in the summer and fall timeframe as we track towards the next academic year. And most certainly we plan to share new opportunities uh, for students through this community here. So we hire for a uh, vast variety of roles from technically focused roles to business oriented roles and roles that are a blend of both tech and business. And depending upon individuals' interests, we also have roles that are you know, internally facing or client facing. So to give you some additional context, we hire for a variety of di different developer roles from software, hardware, we hire data scientists, product managers, consultants and, and various other roles as well. So when we kick off recruiting in the fall, all roles will be posted to Nittany Lion Careers. Um, and in the meantime, I'm more than happy to be a point of contact for students um, interested in learning more. So without further ado, I will turn it over to the star of the show here, fellow IBMer, um, Jane Snowden. Thank you very much, Maggie. It is really a great honor to be invited to speak virtually in my hometown, State College, and at Penn State, my undergraduate alma mater, as part of the Nittany AI Connect seminar series. 
Today, I'm going to talk about how to evaluate any health information technology, but specifically those using artificial intelligence to allow those technologies to be adopted safely and effectively in healthcare settings. I will also talk a little bit about my career in informatics as an industry research scientist. Next slide. Just wanted to mention IBM's forward-looking statement and then to begin by saying AI is not new. There's a lot of hype about AI in healthcare. Everyone is working on it. So why is that? Well, in the early 1990s, not much healthcare data was available online. People didn't use electronic healthcare records or EHRs or computerized systems. And those that did had small siloed data centers, data sets. Since then, there have been advances in technologies to store data and increased adoption of electronic healthcare records, imaging picture archiving and communication or PAC systems and other health IT. So now we have the opposite problem, enormous and growing complex data sets of structured and mostly unstructured data. Clinicians need to keep up with the medical literature, contextualize it and apply it to their patient. Medline is the National Library of Medicine's premier biographical, uh, bibliographic, sorry, database that contains more than 27 million references to journal articles. A new article is published every three minutes in Medline. There are 35,000 clinical trial publications per year, and medical data is doubling every 73 days. So this could be data from lab results, images, um, and other information that your um, medical device sensors are, are producing. In the 1990s, data sets were stored separately, often using different hardware and software that didn't talk to each other. Now data can be shared and processed reliably and securely using technologies like hybrid cloud and blockchain. Finally, over the last several decades, advances in both hardware and computer science techniques like deep learning and quantum computing have given us the computational power and tools to actually be able to analyze and utilize the large and complex data sets available to us in healthcare. On the next slide, so now really is the time for AI to be able to have an impact in health and healthcare delivery. So the question is, does it? The answer is probably yes, but we still have a long way to go. Let's take a look on the next slide at blockchain as one example of where AI is having an impact. Blockchain became famous as the technology underpinning Bitcoin, but its uses go far beyond payments. It's really a way to have trusted transactions for everything. There are four features that define blockchain. First, it is a distributed shared ledger with no central control. Second, it must be permissioned. Only those involved in the transaction should have access to it. Third, every transaction must be approved by a consensus of participants in the blockchain. The record is then permanent and cannot be altered or deleted. Fourth, a blockchain ledger can be enhanced with smart contracts, business terms embedded in the transaction database and executed along with transactions. Security, confidentiality, and privacy are paramount for blockchain, like any other system of record, and blockchain uses the world's strongest forms of encryption to protect integrity of its data. On the next slide, one of the most important applications of blockchain is that of improving global trade logistics. A study of Maersk, the world's largest shipping company, found that a simple shipment of refrigerated goods from East Africa to Europe can go through nearly 30 people and organizations. It involves more than 200 different interactions and communications, and the loss of a slip of paper along the way can delay a shipment import anywhere from several weeks to a month. We can now put all of the parties in transactions like this on a blockchain where everything is visible and terms can be executed automatically. Each participant 
in the supply chain ecosystem can view the progress of goods through the supply chain, understanding where a container is in transit. They can also see the status of custom documents or view bills of landing and other data. Detailed visibility of the container's progress through the supply chain is enhanced with the real-time exchange of original supply chain events and documents. No one party can modify, delete, or even append any record without the approval of others on the network. This level of transparency helps reduce fraud and errors. It also reduces the time the products spend in transit and shipping process. It improves inventory and ultimately reduces waste and cost. Resulting from pioneering work by IBM Research with colleagues from Maersk, in August of 2018, the two companies announced the creation of TradeLens, jointly developed to apply blockchain to the world's global supply chain. On the next slide, another IBM Research invention was announced called the IBM Crypto Anchor Verifier. This is an artificial intelligent mobile sensor that can discern authentic products from counterfeits, such as pharmaceutical drugs, wine, oil, paper, metals, and many other items. We built the verifier for a blockchain project where the client asked, how can we be sure that the data we put on the blockchain actually describes the physical product moving through the supply chain? The verifier captures unique opaque optical and spectral properties of a substance and records it on the blockchain. When the physical substance is bought or traded to another participant, the other participants will be able to scan the substance with their verifier. The verifier can check if the data they've scanned from the physical asset matches the data that was originally placed on the blockchain when the substance was created, farmed, mined, or manufactured. So this is of critical importance when we're looking at the authenticity of pharmaceutical drugs, for example. So on the next slide, um, let's look at all the stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem. Um, there are, for example, AI tools for healthcare providers that offer clinical decision support, AI tools for healthcare payers that detect fraud and claims databases or identify drivers of cost in healthcare systems. There are AI tools for purchasers of healthcare like chatbots that help a consumer choose the best health benefits plan. AI tools for policymakers can predict the value of a particular program or initiative. AI tools for health for life sciences companies can identify targets for drug development or optimize trial design to accelerate clinical trials. And AI tools for patients can help them manage chronic diseases like diabetes by identifying trends in their glucose monitoring data. Some of these tools are widely used, but others, especially those in frontline clinical practice, really haven't gained traction or widespread adoption. So you might ask why. There are many reasons, but one is in a lack of trust. A lack of trust from not understanding such tools that the data scientists are developing and an erosion in trust that is some of the failures. The tech startup of fail fast motto is not one that goes over well in healthcare. On the next slide, here's something that I love. Trust is one of IBM's three core values, trust and responsibility in all relationships. So in healthcare, trust is built with scientific evidence. How many times have you heard follow the science in the last year? Before a new medicine or device or vaccine is introduced in healthcare, clinicians, patients, and their families want scientific studies that show that it is safe and effective, and the FDA requires such studies for drugs and devices. However, most AI that is used um, is to assist but not replace humans, um, and this AI is not regulated such studies aren't required and often aren't done. So I believe it is the responsibilities of all developers of AI tools for healthcare, whether created in industry or developed in academic medical centers to do the studies necessary to ensure they can be introduced safely and effectively into healthcare settings. 
Watson Health has committed to providing this essential scientific evidence about our solutions. Science that shows our solutions work and have an impact on health, not just by anecdote or net promoter score, which um, reflects satisfaction and the fact that you might recommend it to a colleague or another business partner, but in fact, with rigorous published scientific studies, which builds trust in healthcare. In 2016, after a 20 year career at IBM Research, building models of manufacturing systems, airline scheduling and flight route planning systems and thermal models for energy efficient buildings, I transferred to Watson Health as the Associate Chief Health Officer in the Center for AI Research and Evaluation, affectionately known as CARE Team, which is a center charged with generating evidence for safety and efficacy of Watson Health solutions. I've been leading teams of program managers, ethnographers, biomedical data scientists, informaticians, statisticians, natural language processing specialists, biomedical writers, and physicians in conducting scientific evaluation studies of our life sciences, genomics, and government health and human services solutions. Since January of this year, I took on a new role leading scientific operations for the center. And this center is part of the larger Health Officers Promoting Excellence and Evidence, or the HOPE team. So let's take a look on the next slide at the evidence framework. AI evaluation in healthcare requires sequential and systematic studies, like all other science in healthcare. Each study is an important brick in the foundation of evidence that is needed for safe and effective implementation and adoption of AI in healthcare. So how do we build this foundation? So a simple framework for the evaluation of health IT, including AI tools is shown on this slide. The first step is making sure that tools technically do what they're supposed to do. For example, making sure that the AI algorithms predict risk or classify things accurately. Evaluation of NLP or machine learning tools are very similar to evaluation of diagnostic tests and they're measured with metrics such as sensitivity, specificity and area under the curve. A few key points on technical performance studies. One is that real clinicians should be involved in these evaluations to set thresholds for performance. For example, the consequence of a false negative, such as missing a lung lesion in an AI tool that automatically interprets an image may be high, whereas a false positive in identifying relevant scientific articles from the literature may be somewhat lower. Secondly, establishing a baseline to approve upon is also important. When early AI systems were developed, people would arbitrarily decide that the system should perform at say 90% accuracy. When humans did the same task with only 50% accuracy, you know, like flipping a coin. So this, it's really important to do comparisons between the AI system and the, I'm sorry, between the clinician and then the clinician aided by the AI system. The second step is usability and workflow. When we know tools technically do what they're supposed to do, we must do studies to ensure that they can be used by their intended users and can accomplish the desired tasks in the appropriate healthcare workflow. And then finally, impact. We ultimately want to show that AI tools have an impact on health, such as saving lives, reducing costs, or ideally both. When AI tools are first introduced, we often look at proximal or process outcomes. Do clinical decisions support tools change decisions? Do population health management tools save time? Only later can one look at long-term outcomes, such as do they improve clinical outcomes, such as survival, reoccurrence, or reduce costs. On the next slide, two other points are important, order and repetition. Evaluation must be done systematically. The order shown here is designed to avoid confounders. 
When new AI tools are introduced, clinicians are often quick to ask to do a randomized control trial to measure impact. And while randomized trials are certainly a long-term evaluation goal, if you don't know your tool works technically and you haven't evaluated its usability in a real clinical workflow, you are setting yourself up to fail. And for a new tool, you probably don't know your effect size to appropriately power that randomized trial. And then repetition is also important. A natural language processing algorithm that works well for primary care notes may not work well on notes written by trauma surgeons or rheumatologists. Whenever conditions change, this process needs to be repeated. This is especially true for AI systems that learn and may change performance over time. So on the next slide, this diagram shows a phase research framework for evaluating AI in healthcare. This sequential approach can be compared to the phases of clinical research for drugs and medical devices, with which everyone is now familiar, thanks to the attention of COVID-19 vaccine development has received. There are similarities, but there are also important differences when we're talking about AI in healthcare. The preclinical or phase zero phase um, involves algorithm development and prototyping where proof of concept technical performance is tested. Phase one testing for safety and efficacy involves expanded algorithm evaluation on robust data sets, as well as usability testing on prototypes. In phase two, AI tools can be put into real clinical workflows and evaluated for performance, usability, and integration into the workflow in real clinical settings. Here, AI algorithms differ from drugs and devices, which tend to function in a relatively predictable manner, whereas the output of an AI system must be understood, trusted, contextualized, and used by humans, which can be highly unpredictable. In phase two trials, effect size can be estimated. Phase three trials are typically randomized studies to definitively measure impact. Here, it's important to choose the right comparator. Although many love the drama of human versus machine, the evolution of an AI tool that is intended to be used to assist a clinician should compare clinicians with and without the tool, not human versus machine. Finally, AI tools need continuous monitoring for performance, which can change based upon many factors, such as changes in the data, the target population, or the algorithms learning over time. This phased approach is published um, and described in a perspectives in Jamia Open last fall. On the next slide, uh, whether you are developing or evaluating artificial intelligence, especially in healthcare, broad and deep expertise is required and it's definitely a team sport. The composition of the care team at IBM is shown here. Design, development, and evaluation of AI needs biomedical informaticians who have multidisciplinary training in medicine and computer scientists, along with domain experts such as radiologists, surgeons, or biological scientists. Algorithm development and technical performance studies require expertise in computer science techniques such as machine learning and natural language processing. Design efforts and usability and workflow studies need qualitative researchers with expertise in psychology, medical anthropology, ethnography, behavioral change, and human factors engineering. All scientific studies need program managers and research coordinators to support study execution, data scientists and statisticians for analysis, and biomedical writers to aid in the dissemination of the research. On the next slide, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the importance of industry science. So one thing that's unusual is that I am an engineer by training and by taking online courses offered by universities such as pharmacogenomics from Stanford, reading medical literature and learning from our on-staff clinicians. I am in industry science and I'm in the most academic job I've ever had. 
one aspect of my performance is actually evaluated by how much I publish and how much the team publishes. Industry science is the fast lane and the real world. And what do I mean by that? First, technology changes really quickly and in industry, we need to do studies fast enough to keep pace with rapid technology evolution. In industry, we also get to answer questions that matter. Many of our studies are done with clients who say, I will use your tool, but to continue to use it, you have to show me it has value. Our team works with clients to define what value means, and then we design the appropriate study to show that. On the next slide, we can all agree that good science is collaborative and the quality of the work is not based so much on who is doing it as much as it is dependent on having rigorous and reproducible scientific methods. We all have biases and conflicts and they are most appropriately managed by full disclosure and transparency, not categorical exclusion. One of the ways we have supported doing the best science to evaluate and advance AI is through industry and academic collaborations. And I'll be describing those in a moment. Um, but first, let me introduce on the next slide um, what we mean by health equity. It's really important to recognize where disparities come from because this can inform blind spots and biases and models. Health disparities can come from differences in social position that's based upon age, race, ethnicity, social economic status, and uh, where you live geographically. It can also come from differences in direct exposure, exposure to disease, like acute conditions such as COVID, disparities in susceptibility to disease, such as acute and chronic conditions, disparities in access to and utilization of care, and disparities in treatment, both in direct care settings and disease management. Taken all together, the additive effects of multiple disparities result in unequal levels of illness and death. On the next slide, I wanted to share with you a study that our team has done um, using the IBM Market Scan commercial claims or insurance claims data to determine if there were race and ethnic disparities in the prevalence of 15 chronic health conditions across 1.3 million employees from 46 large US employers and found that for certain disease conditions an overall number of comorbidities, certain race and ethnic groups were significantly different from the others. For example, Native Americans and whites had a significantly higher prevalence of COPD than Hispanics and Asians, but no difference in prevalence compared with other groups. These insights can provide guidance for both employer support programs and cautions against unfairly discriminating against groups with higher conditions um, prevalence in wellness programs offered by the employer. On the next slide, um, both academic and corporate organizations have produced AI tools for healthcare, but their safe and effective adoption rely on comprehensive and systematic scientific evaluation, as well as substantial resources to implement and deploy them broadly. The domain and clinical expertise, access to clinical data and health environments, and the scientific reputation of academic institutions can be combined with the diverse talent, funding, resources, and infrastructure and industry to support evaluation and scale deployment of AI. Such collaborations can help minimize bias in evaluating new technologies in healthcare, such as taking the tasks of data collection or interpretation out of the hands of those producing or selling a product or service. They can also enable the best scientists to work together to produce groundbreaking research and innovation. On the next slide, IBM has made several investments to accelerate the science of AI in medicine. In 2016, we announced a five-year partnership with the Broad Institute, which is a collaboration between MIT and Harvard University. 
This academic industry partnership focused on using machine learning and genomics to understand how and why cancers develop resistance to therapies. In February of 2019, the scope of the work was expanded to include developing predictive models for serious cardiovascular events, such as heart attack, sudden cardiac death, and atrial fibrillation. In 2017, IBM announced a 10-year, $240 million investment to create the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, which allows IBM and MIT scientists to work side by side to advance the science of AI. In February of 2019, IBM Watson Health announced a $50 million investment in research collaborations with Brigham and Women's Hospital, the leading teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School and Vanderbilt University Medical Center, both leaders in health informatics. Let me show you next a few examples of some of the scientific studies that our team has done at Watson Health. In part of this talk, I'll be discussing some IBM products about which I'm obviously biased, but we'll be showing you visual abstracts to support the statements I make with science because that's my job. First, um, Micromedics is a rich pharmacological knowledge base that can be accessed in two ways one through a standard keyword search, or secondly, by a conversational agent like Watson Assistant, which supports dialogue in natural language. For example, I could put in a keyword search for deep vein thrombosis, or I could ask Watson Assistant, what is the adult dose of river oxibon, which is a blood thinner used to treat deep vein thrombosis. What are the side effects? What are the precautions? So um, this enables an individual to ask in more natural language um, questions and nested questions about information that they're looking uh, about particular pharmaceutical drugs. And in the first few months of release of Watson Assistant, we examined the accuracy of Watson Assistant conversations and it correctly identified an answer in 80% of the questions that were in scope. And when compared to queries done by keyword search, a much broader range of topics were accessed, suggesting the conversation agent enabled richer queries. And this is a piece of work that was published in Jamia Open earlier this year and is an example of technical performance study. On the next slide, Micromedics can be used as a standalone tool or integrated with an electronic health record. In another study done with a client, Peninsula Regional Medical Center, we showed that usage increased after EHR integration. This project was a usability and satisfaction study where clients reported the tool was easy to use and save time in survey responses. And this work was presented by our clients at the 2019 HIMSS or Health Information and Management Systems Society meeting. In another study on the next page, uh, was something I personally was involved in. Um, New York City Social Services implemented an online and mobile version of our social program management software to facilitate applications for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, which is a program previously known as Food Stamps. New York City provides nutrition assistance for more than 1.6 million city clients each month or approximately four and a half percent of the national SNAP recipients. An adapted design thinking workshop uh, approach was used with SNAP center facilitators and outreach workers to really inform enhancements to the tool to provide greater configurability for reacting to policy changes, such as you know, benefits that were issued during COVID for um, food and nutrition supplements, um, increased access to benefits, providing benefits more cost effectively, and improving eligible individuals' experiences and outcomes. A lot of um, 
times before the mobile app was um, implemented, um, many of the applications were rejected because there were um, supporting documentation that was missing. But uh, through the mobile app that can be accessed online, um, if we look pre and post um, year to year comparisons, there were significant increases in logins, online applications, and recertifications for those benefits to be continued and were processed. On the next slide, um, another study that I personally was involved in is called uh, a cloud-based Watson Care Manager tool and Connect360, which enabled a master data record to be made about 91,000 residents in Sonoma County, California. And um, unfortunately, Sonoma County has been hit over the past several years with wildfire crises and they have a huge homeless population. And their citizens often have multiple medical um, and health diseases, uh, criminal justice issues, and the need for food and shelter, all of which require integrated care from often siloed social services. We've done several qualitative studies describing how the system supports the county care managers work, even um, the ability to go into the homeless tent camps using iPads and being able to enter data off the grid. And then when you get back to the office, you're able to upload those notes and results um, into the system. And this research has been published and presented at the 2019 American Medical Informatics Association or AMIA meeting, as well as published in Applied Clinical Informatics as a case report um, in the next slide, um, I wanted to describe a solution developed in collaboration with Medtronic called Sugar IQ, which takes continuous glucose monitoring data from type 1 diabetes patients and generates actionable insights to help patients manage their disease. In one algorithm evaluation and technical performance study, data from 10,000 type 1 diabetics were used to train and test a model to predict hypoglycemic events. And the model performed with a 90% area under the receiver operating characteristics curve, with 80% of predictions being able to predict, be predicted over one hour in advance. This is a technical performance study that was presented at the American Diabetes Association meeting in 2019. And since that time on the next slide, the team has worked to extend the time horizon for prediction and subsequently shown their algorithms are able to predict hypoglycemia 90% of the time with a two to three hour advance window. And users of the system spend an average extra 36 minutes a day in a safe glucose range. Our team has also worked with the developers on the challenging problem of predicting nocturnal hypoglycemia while asleep at night with a long time horizon. And they published that work at AMIA 2019. On the next slide, I wanted to share um, a couple studies that we've been doing during COVID. Um, this one about a COVID chatbot, which is a conversational agent. And this highlights um, Watson Assistant, which is something anyone can use for free. You can set up an account today and develop your own conversational agents for up to 10,000 messages and 1,000 users per month. And during the early pandemic, IBM made it available for enterprise um, solutions with support to develop conversational agents to address COVID um, frequently asked questions. Um, for example, governments uh, were even agencies were receiving a lot of citizen questions about new and changing policies. Employers were answering employee questions about working from home and provider organizations were answering family and patient questions about getting medical care safely. 
and health plans were answering beneficiary questions about new COVID related benefits. Over 100 different institutions have used Watson Assistant to build conversational agents and most clients were able to get them up and running quickly. The 37 organizations that shared data with us delivered over 6.8 million messages between March and August of last year. So this is really enabling um, these agencies and providers to be able to free up their time from um, answering the phone for those you know, repeated questions like, where do I, where's the nearest place for me to get a, a COVID test, for example. Um, on the next slide, I wanted to share with you um, another study that I was personally involved in looking at clinical trials. And this study investigated the utilization and impact of a clinical data management system called IBM Clinical Development on the running of two COVID clinical trials, one for a vaccine and the other for a therapeutic drug by Veristat, which is a contract research organization. And uh, we did a, a mixed method study here using um, surveys and interviews, as well as looked at de-identified um, backend data about the utilization of the tool. And what we found is that there were excellent ratings for both the average system usability score of um, 80.6 and net promoter score of 75%. In addition, ICD would decrease the average time to design and release the study database by between 63 and 72%. This is, um, really a, a testament, I think, to the ability to reuse um, libraries of code um, and, and artifacts, templates um, to get a new database up and running. Um, during non-COVID times, it would take the CRO typically 30 to 40 days, but during COVID, they were able to get these databases up and running in 11 business days. And the other, um, fact of note was that they had less than one hour of downtime for mid-study updates or post-go-live updates, um, which were um, one of the main reasons for impacting speed. So you might imagine, you know, when you're in the middle of a clinical trial collecting data from, from patients, um, this was a very um, dynamic time where therapeutics were coming onto the, onto the market, which may impact your ability to recruit for clinical trials. And so having the ability to quickly um, pivot and um, perform these mid-study updates was really helpful in um, continuing the, the trials and having high, high user satisfaction by the clinical data managers. So on the next slide, um, in closing, let me reiterate a few of the take home messages about evaluation of AI in healthcare. And I hope I've been able to share with you a, a few of the examples of the types of um, technical performance, usability and workflow and health outcome scientific studies that our team has performed. So one is that it's scientific evidence is really critical to building trust in healthcare. Comprehensive AI evaluation requires systematic, sequential, robust studies of technical performance, usability and workflow and impact. Third, um, repeat evaluation is necessary whenever conditions change and AI systems learn. It's also very important to document baseline human performance for the processes that AI systems aim to improve so as not to create unrealistic expectations and to design studies with appropriate comparators, not pitting human against machine, but rather comparing humans with and without AI systems, where the systems are designed to support humans. And finally, multidisciplinary teams are critical, including team members from academics, industry, and all the stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem. The COVID pandemic has clearly illustrated what we can achieve when we have leaders who can bring together 
governments, academics, and industry to do the impossible, such as bringing new vaccines to clinical use in less than one year. On the next slide, um, IBM has a long history of leading in and leading with science. And if you're interested in the scientific work done by IBM Watson Health, you can visit our website shown here to view our scientific publications and quarterly scientific reports. So on the next slide, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak at the Nittany AI Alliance Connect event, and I'll be happy to take any questions. If anybody wants to, they are more than welcome to open up their microphone and ask a question. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that were submitted. Um, so if anybody wants to go first, that's fine. If not, I have a couple questions actually for you. Um, what, if anything, is being done to improve efficiency of the delivery of health care? Um, Patty, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, I, I hope I've been able to share with you a, a couple of the examples um, in my talk today. Um, I know there was um, interest um, from one of the participants, particularly in the area of surgical services and what we're doing there to improve um, healthcare delivery. And this is an area um, of interest to us really from a um, performance um, and efficiency point of view as you're looking at the, um, the patient flow, the physical, um, the physician flow and the room flow, really three different flows. And you're looking at um, the wait times and the prep times, right? As patients are being admitted, say an hour and a half before surgery, you've got um, the wheels in to the wheels out time in the operating room and the actual case duration, the actual time surgery um, is being um, done and then the recovery time. So one of the things we're very interested in looking at is are there um, more efficient, more effective ways of scheduling um, the rooms, the physicians, the, um, and the staff that are, that are um, the care providers that are supporting, um, let's say OR. So this is, a, I think, an area of interest. We're also very active in the area of imaging. Um, for those of you that are interested in reading our scientific report, which we just published um, about fourth quarter results, it's all focused on imaging. And um, the fact that you know, radiologists see thousands of images per day. And you know, this is a task that is very taxing um, and tiring. And um, in some cases, you know, some, some nodules or lesions may be missed, but, um, but with a computer who can look over time at you know, hundreds and, and thousands of images, they can notice subtle changes um, in those images, which can then be um, highlighted to the radiologist to say, you know, this is an area of interest perhaps you, you know, could spend time looking at these areas. And so um, I think these are some of the, the new areas that we see have a lot of potential in Im improving um, delivery of care. Great. Uh, another question we had was, are there business models for expanding healthcare in the home? Yes, so there are, um, you know, the, the whole concept of patient-centered medical home um, is something that has been gaining popularity. Um, more people are uh, desiring to, to stay at home rather than going into nursing homes. And so some of, we actually have a lab set up at research where we're, we're, we have censored a home and, you know, we're looking at um, various inputs from sensors that are around the home, right, which could pick up um, uh, information about, you know, has a person walked from one room to another room? Has that person, you know, 
uh, eaten today? Are they, um, you know, has the has the care care um, social worker been to visit today? You know, all of these um, different things can be um, monitored remotely, and um, I think is a very important um, area for for the future as more and more people are deciding to to stay home at end of life. I have a question here saying, can you talk in general about the ethical and privacy challenges in using AI in healthcare and advances in this area? Yeah, this is a really important um, issue. And I think that, you know, one of the things that IBM feels really strongly about is, is the, the de-identification of any medical records before we actually receive them or look at them or analyze them. So much of uh, the work that we do is on de-identified um, medical records, patients who have given their consent um, for that purpose. And so, um, you know, information is able to be um, uh, analyzed about the, say, cohorts of patients, groups of patients that exhibit common chronic conditions. You don't know who they are, but you know information about that population and you can look at outcomes for that particular population, for example. So, um, you know, I think it's really important to, and you know, the laws vary from country to country in terms of um, privacy and data sharing. In some countries you can consent to a procedure or you can consent to your information being used in research, or you can consent to your information being used in research, but only for cancer research. So it's really important to understand the different um, local rules and regulations that um, impact the, the use of data and to protect the privacy of the, of the individual. I think also too, there is a, um, from an ethical point of view, there's a responsibility on behalf of the researcher. So as an example, um, I've done a lot of work in the area of genomics and we were looking at patients with a particular type of cancer. Um, and if there are cases um, where you know, our, our Watson for Genomics tool was identifying um, variants and potential um, therapeutics or clinical trials that a particular um, patient might be eligible for, you know, if there was something missing you know, that um, had been provided to us in terms of a, um, a physician who had um, looked at at what they thought were the, the variants and, and possible therapies. If there's a mismatch, it's really important to understand like, what is that mismatch? Is there new evidence that's been published in the literature? Is it um, a particular drug was not available in that particular region or geography? Um, but you know, I think ethically there is a, a responsibility on behalf of the researcher to go back to the, the um, sponsoring uh, research institution to say, you know, you know, flagging something that we feel might be important uh, in particular treatment. So I think we have time for one last question. I have one here. It says, are there any training programs for AI and ML through IBM? Um, yes, there are. And um, if you go to www.ibm.com slash training slash AI learning, there are um, many courses um, that you can take online. So I would encourage you all to, um, to take a look at that. And let me just type that into the chat here so that everybody has it. Yeah, wonderful. Great, well, we are just about out of time. I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Snowden. Uh, we really appreciate your time and insights this afternoon. I also want to thank Maggie O'Shea for your insight into IBM's recruiting efforts for the fall. 
And finally, thank you to everyone in the audience for your participation. We really hope that you will join us for future events. And you can find those on our website and social media pages, or you can join our email list for updates. We really hope you enjoyed our discussion and we hope you have a wonderful evening.